All right. Um, this morning we'll start off with our new case, Germany, and um, we'll follow the same structure as were the cases for Britain, France, and the US. Um, so, so we basically will be talking about first German state and historical perspective, then political economy of economic and social policies, then governance and policy making, followed by representation and participation, and finally, uh, some current challenges. Um, here is what the German lands look like. We have a population of over 80 million, 81 to 82. Um, this is the most populated state within the European Union. Um, and uh, which, I mean, geographically, um, it's, it's smaller than France. It's about half the size of Turkey. I think that, that's, that's a good comparison. It's about 380 uh, square kilometers, 360 square kilometers. Um, it's even smaller than um, Turkey's size. The capital city is Berlin, as you know. Um, currency is the, the euro, the euro. Um, it's a federal country composed of 16 lander. So um, Land is the German word for state province, OK? And the, um, the, the plural form of Land is Länder. So, so we, we have 16 Länder, which more or less corresponds to um, medieval kingdoms, principalities, um, and, and um, other trading cities. Um, we do not have, uh, we do not have um, natural borders around surrounding Germany. So German lands have always been prone to attacks from, from all sides. Um, so there's no mountain ranges, um, well, except for the south. But, um, but here we have all of this area as mountainous. Um, we do not have major rivers separating the land from, from other um, sovereign units. Uh, and we do not have, you know, I mean, yes, there is up north the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, but most of the land, as you can see, the borders are not in, in a way naturally or geographically protected. Um, so, so Germany has been on, on route to east, west, west, east and to a certain extent, north, south, south, north. And it has been um, a land of conflict. It has been a land of war, as we shall be talking about. Um, Germany generally, I mean, in general, when you look at the German state in, in the, in its, on its contemporary geography, um, in terms of its contemporary geography, um, we do not have many much resources, natural resources, except for um, this area, which is bordering France, um, which is rich in uh, iron and coal, uh, which is next to us as Lorraine, the neighboring, neighboring France. And um, we have an ethnically homogenous country, which is also important, which has been changing um, since the 50s, well, especially since the 60s, with the German very famous, very well-known Gastarbeiter program, which is the guest worker program. So with the guest worker program, um, many incoming immigrants well, guest workers who sought, I mean, Germany sought these, um, these workers for them to come and help with the reconstruction of Germany during what's called the economic miracle, the German miracle. And, and all of these would, would, uh, would contribute to the reconstruction effort, uh, development of Germany, uh, the German economy, um, so that they would be um, they, they were all, always seen 
probably ent until about the 1980s as a productive factor and that they were, they were generally welcome. Um, we, we shall be talking about this in, um, in detail later on. Um, but when we look at the religious composition, um, that's also interesting. We have slightly larger than uh, one third of the population um, Catholic, another third uh, Protestant, and another third is about, I mean, it's basically um, other uh, whatever is, is there. Um, with the Reformation of the 16th century, uh, Martin Luther challenged the Roman Catholic Church practices, uh, all of which brought this, this mix in terms of a third um, Protestant um, followers or followers of Protestantism. So this is what Germany looks like in the current period. I'll show you a map of medieval Germany, um, and I'll, I'll try to compare the maps um, later on. Um, but everything starts on the land called Germania, or Germania, um, by about um, AD 100. AD stands for Anno Domini, which is after Christ 100. Um, we have independent municipality, I'm sorry, independent principalities under the Holy Roman Empire between the 10th century up until the end of, or well into the 19th century. Um, so lands, German lands became 300 largely independent units. Um, principalities, and these we call them Habsburg crown lands, which, um, which really span contemporary Austria, uh, what used to be Bohemia, which is around Czech Republic and Slovakia, and parts of Hungary. So, so um, large span um, under um, Habsburg crown lands. 16th century Reformation. Um, the authority of Catholic Habsburgs had been undermined. Uh, so, so with the 16th century, the Holy Roman Empire was divided into two. Um, one is the Austrian Habsburgs, and um, the second is the Kingdom of Prussia. Um, and when we talk about Prussia, this is the most largest, powerful German state in history. So from the uh, 17th century onwards, we have, um, or, or late 16th century, early 17th century onwards, we have a um, very important state uh, which, which, um, which is one of the central strongholds um, among the European powers. Um, all of this came about from the 15th century onwards um, through a centralization um, under a new dynasty, the Hohenzollern dynasty, uh, which later, uh, which, which, which was situated in, in Berlin. Um, in fact, later on, I mean, the capital city was Berlin. In fact, later on, it was in Potsdam. Um, they had a schloss, a castle, the Sanssouci castle, um, where, um, you know, Frederick the Great, you know, from by about mid 18th century until late 18th century uh, reigned. Um, the, the Prussians, the Hohenzollern dynasty was very effective in uh, reorganizing the Prussian army along Calvinist lines, um, you know, many, many mil military victories um, and um, patronage of arts, enlightenment in Prussia. So 18th century, we see enlightenment in this, in this country. Uh, power was based on mercantilism. What was mercantilism all about? Mercantilism is an economic doctrine. It's a set of policies where you try to export as much as you can, and you try to import as, as less as you can. Um, 
and um, so, so you basically produce, try to produce for world markets, you follow protectionist policies, um, you protect your domestic industries, domestic producers, farmers, against um, competition stemming from, from uh, foreign countries. And we have a centralized uh, bureaucracy, which includes, I mean, of course, as this is a typical example of what we've talked about in the, the first couple of weeks, the absolute state. So um, centralized bureaucracy means that we have a strong centralized army, uh, which was a model for, for many nations uh, that envied their, their military victories. Um, so, so this was the largest and most powerful German state by the, sixth, uh, by the 17th century, 18th century Enlightenment. Um, and uh, we've seen Friedrich de Grosse um, as the ruler of, 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 of Prussian Germany, um, which was one of the most influential powers in European history. Let's see what the Holy Roman Empire looked like. This is about early 16th century, so 1500s. As you can see, we've got the Austrians, um, Austrian kingdoms, Bavarians, Burgundians, uh, you know, Rhenish, Franconian, Lower Saxon or Saxony, uh, Swabian, Upper Saxony. So, so we've, um, we have, as you can see, um, this is, Bav uh, this is Bohemia, um, contemporary Bavaria, um, parts of France, um, Flanders, parts of um, Belgium and also Netherlands, Holland. Um, so city-states, um, I cannot see Bremen here, but it should be around here. Um, so, so, so as you can see, we have principalities, um, kingdoms, um, and a lot of small units making up, in a way, uh, one large, less cohesive empire. But then, with the Prussians, uh, we see um, the emergence of the First Reich. Um, so, so Holy Roman Empire um, was the first German entity in that respect, the First Reich. Um, so, it ends with Napoleon's victory in 1806. There was a nation nationalist reaction within German lands against this defeat. And the First Reich, the First Kingdom, was founded in, in early 1800, so 1806. Um, so basically, Prussia um, and parts of Austria. Um, a little, I mean, just about in about 15 years, less than 15 years, we see um, centralization. The Prussian state was characterized by a centralized army, but also a centralized bureaucracy, effective bureaucracy. But it was time for economic integration. As you saw, if you wanted to trade among these different principalities, and um, kingdoms and other sovereign entities. If you were you know, on the Rhine, if you were um, navigating north, up north, you had to pass through many principalities and kingdoms. And as you passed through them, you had to pay. I mean, um, merchants, tradesmen were or had to pay a toll, uh, in a way, a customs tax to, to basically ship their products or produce uh, from south to, let's say, to port cities up north, to Bremer, Bremen, Bremerhaven, uh, Ham, uh, Hamburg, and, and others. So, so basically, um, so in order to eliminate this, which in a way are non-production costs, in order to eliminate this, these costs, um, the Germans invented um, a customs union, um, which is, which is in, in German, 
uh, called the, 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 the famous Zoll Verein. Um, it's a customs union between Prussia, um, 1819, and other German states. Um, and this, in a way, helped build a, an even stronger state. Okay, so, so we have um, Prussia, um, the First Reich, uh, emerging, um, had been there, had been expanding economically, had, been, um, had, been, had become more wealthy. This was dominated by the Junkers. This is the landed aristocracy. And um, it was defended by a patriotic, very well organized, very centralized military. Um, when we study Germany um, from a comparative historical perspective, we, I mean, the literature, um, sociological or political sociological uh, or political scientific literature, describes Germany or this evolution in German lands as a revolution from above, in, contra in contrast to the first two cases we've seen, um, France and Britain. These, those were called bourgeois revolutions, um, which were brought about by the bourgeoisie, the rising middle classes. But here, um, the literature characterizes Germany as a revolution from above um, in, by, 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 in, by state elite, Otto von Bismarck, um, who was the minister president of Bismarck, um, I'm sorry, uh, minister president of Prussia in 1860s. So, so um, economic integration was in place unification of Germany. So by about 1870s, the German unification process had been completed. Not only economic unification through Solferein, but also political unification uh, under Bismarck. And um, Otto von Bismarck, the, the minister president of Prussia, um, you know, in reaction to pro-democracy revolutions, which were suppressed, um, 1840s, 1848, um, he brings a drive towards modernization. And this is through massive industrialization, modernization of the economy through industrialization. German industrialization is a case of late industrialization. It was the British who industrialized first, which was followed by France and, and Switzerland and others. Um, Germans industrialized late, or in comparative terms, later than the British and the French. Um, but by about 1900, Germany was number one in terms of industrial production in the world. So, so manufactured items. Uh, Germany was a leading uh, stronghold um, in the heart of Europe. Um, the revolution from above, it's a revolution, it's social change, it's political change, it's economic change, has many ramifications in all of these fields. Um, it's a revolution from above in the sense that it was brought up, brought out, brought about by state elite uh, with a um, very influential political leader, Otto von Bismarck, who successfully married the two interests represented by one, Iron, and the other, Rye. Rye represents the Junkers, the landed aristocracy, so the agricultural sector, okay, which was highly productive, uh, especially throughout the 19th century. Um, so very productive agricultural sector. But this was a high time for industrialization, economic unification. So all transaction costs, customs duties, transportation costs had been, had been lowered. With the introduction of industrialization followed the railroads, the railways. Okay? So um, the German bond system 
um, the railroad system was was starting to be built from um, from about this from the 19th century onwards. So the two interests, the agricultural sector and the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector, the, the landed aristocracy and the new um, bourgeoisie um, was, was wedded to one another through, um, through this very influential statesman. Um, and, and in doing so, um, Bismarck relied on elite support and um, the process was um, completed with the, um, with the reunification process, uh, I'm sorry, the unification process of, uh, of 1871. So, so um, First Reich from 1806, so reaction to Napoleon's defeat, um, nationalist reaction, consolidation, Zollverein, um, Bismarck coming to power, um, integrating, consolidating all of these lands under one rule. So consolidation economically, consolidation politically. So we, we see the span of First Reich. Then with, um, with the, um, this is, this, with the Solferein, you see um, Kingdom of Prussia and all other lands coming under one single market. So economic integration in history, um, this is a, a, I mean, one of the very influential models to emulate later on, um, you know, a century after for the European Union, for the European Economic Community to be formed. Um, so, so basically, we see uh, all of these lands, as you can see, uh, on the, on the Baltic coast, um, North Sea, and all of these lands, um, up until the Austrians, and the Swiss, and the French, you see um, a very large land, um, you know, composing a, a customs union. So um, the tariff system, uh, so, so you, basically, you basically protect whomever is there against foreign competitors, okay? which, which brings more wealth, more power, more wealth, more power. Um, Second Reich, um, 1871 till the end of World War I. Um, <clears throat> here, the kingdom, king of Russia, Kaiser, um, you know, Germany is unified by Otto von Bismarck, Germany and Prussia as, as one single land. Uh, so we see this period as the German Empire. It's a largely authoritarian state, strong state, controlled and supported by an industrial elite and also the Junkers. So in this sense, it is in this sense, this was the marriage, this was the product of marriage of iron and rye. So industrial elite and the Junkers produced, I mean, like gave way to this state. Um, so it, it's Prussian dominated, it's Protestant dominated, um, which saw rapid industrialization, which was the main goal of Second Reich. And Germany became the leading industrial power in the world in terms of industrial output by about 1900. So state power is there. Um, banking system was, was, um, was very strong. Large-scale industrialization, large-scale investment by the state in, in many um, strategic sectors of the period, which, was, which were coal, Right, iron, mining, railroads, chemicals, dye industry, uh, electricity, um, and also um, machine tools. So, so you see, not a, I mean, you so so the 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 light industrialization period in a way had been skipped. Forget textiles. 
directly go into heavy industrialization. Okay, so so um, high tech industrialization um, characterizing that particular period, um, which meant that there was um, social dislocation and opposition. The small middle class um, pressured for for democratization. Um, rising of workers um, and, and all segment, segments in societies in, of, of German society who felt that they were in a way um, outside of this massive economic wealth. Um, so social democrats, workers, um, they all demanded not only political but also economic rights. And um, Bismarck persecuted all opposition um, banned the Social Democratic Party, um, but built the German welfare state. So that's also very important. It built the German welfare state in reaction to, to all this. So in this sense, Bismarck has been known, uh, or Bismarckian way of um, Organizing the society is, is one example of an iron fist in a velvet glove. Um, so um, so you, you have the velvet glove of the welfare state, caring, protective, but an iron fist within it. Um, authoritarian um, and, and, um, and basically highly centralized, um, very authoritarian. Um, and um, does not let any, any opposition. Um, so, so this was, so by about 1900, Germany superpower became superpower in terms of industrial output, but it needed raw materials as well as market access. And this was the high time um, for, I mean, late 19th century, this was the high time uh, for, um, for imperialism, for coloni colonization activities. And this was sometimes referred to in the literature, in history books, as the scramble for Africa. So um, the East, Asia, uh, was already colonized. Latin America already colonized. Uh, Europe is under you know, um, colonial powers themselves under the control of these powers. So where would you go? Um, so scramble for Africa. This was the high time for, um, for seeking markets, seeking raw materials in Africa. Um, Germany had lack of profitable colonies because when Germany was on the scene by about late 19th century, early 20th century, everywhere in the world, wherever that could be colonized had already been colonized. So, um, so, so they, they, they had to expand. They had to find resources. Uh, they had to find markets. Um, and they were exposed geographically because of, of um, absence of geographical um, frontiers protecting them also. And the idea of patriotism, the idea of nationalism, the reaction to Napoleon's defeat early 1900, 1900s uh, had always been there. And um, economic nationalism, protectionism, Zollverein, um, marriage of Iron and Rye. So all of these centralized state, powerful state, the German ideals, okay, so nationalist ideals. We want to be number one in the world. Uh, we challenge all nations uh, had been there. And um, this all resulted in the, um, the, the breaking up uh, of, well, 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 in fact, the emergence of World War I. Um, the, and, and with the, um, with the World War I, you, you, I'm sure you remember from Ottoman uh, history too, uh, Germans were defeated, uh, Treaty of Versailles and, and others, 
um, meant that, that basically we see the end of Germany, which will then um, lead to another entity, um, the Weimar Republic. It was the Social Democrats who came to power right after the war. Um, they signed the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so monarchy collapses. Social Democrats come to power. They sign the Treaty of Versailles. And this was a time in which Germany had to pay massive war reparations, compensations. Um, let, me, let me summarize this for you. 13% of German pre-war territory. So German territory, 13% um, had been lost. So taken away. And, and this territory contained almost all of iron ore. So three-fourths of iron ore lost. 10% of population, which was a productive factor, which is a productive factor, especially during that period, lost. Um, one quarter of coal lost. Um, all colonies in Africa, as well as in the Pacific, gone. The army surrenders. Fleet surrenders. Locomotives, railroads, wagon cars, trucks surrender. They're, they're all gone. Um, armed forces restructured with a shock as such. Um, war reparations, so compensation, um, which is 132 billion gold marks which is twice the size of German GDP. So you have debt, or think of it as debt, think of it as you know, compensation because they've lost the war, they had to pay in return twice the size of GDP, German GDP. So how is this possible? Plus psychologically war guilt, the guilt of having started off a war. Um, so Germans will accept the responsibility of causing loss and damage. So imagine what this could have done to a nation. A nation which was built on a or around a patriotic military, which was a superpower just 10, 15 years ago, you know, dominates world markets, economic stronghold, politically centralized, but devastated. So this was, in a way, the second major, major defeat in the psyche the German psyche of the time. Uh, so the conditions of the treaty were so heavy that the central bank had to print money um, in order to pay for all these reparations, um, compensations. And if there is so much of something in any given market, what happens to its value? If there is so much of something, huh? It just decreases. Um, and this is, um, I wanted to show you a photo of um, German banknotes being pulped for use as waste paper. Or um, bank banknotes were used to light the stove. Um, so basically, the value of the mark had been so, so low, had gone so low, that, that all of this um, was calling for something else, some, some change. Um, and this was a period of what's called procedural democracy. 
um, formal political institutions, but without political backing, political support. Um, I have figures for the value of USD, US dollar vis-a-vis -vis the gold marks of the period. Um, so one, one USD is equal to um, 4.2 gold marks. So this is 1914, 1918 goes up to 14. Um, it 1922 um, goes up to 493. Uh, again in 1923 uh, goes up to 17,792. Um, and again in 1923 uh, later on that year, goes up to 4.2 trillion. Um, so this is hyperinflation for you. Um, so this is the value of German money, um, the gold mark. And, and that was how or why they were um, used as, um, you know, instead of wood, you, you were burning uh, the marks. So, so there was so much instability, um, economic instability, which brought, it, brought with it political instability. And in the meantime, you had a new leader in the making. Um, Adolf Hitler, um, leader of nationalist, National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi Party, um, 1920 imprisoned, was imprisoned, put into prison after having tried or staging a coup. Um, the attempt failed, um, so basically um, couldn't succeed. He allied with the conservatives and with that alliance he was appointed as the chancellor in 1933. Um, and so, so he, was, he was controlling the parliament um, and in the meantime there was so much political instability and economic instability. Um, many thought Hitler was a moderate leader, the conservatives, but later on they realized that, um, that this wasn't the case. So, um, so here is a leader who comes to power, who promises change. And he says, I'm going to change the world for you. He obtains emergency powers from the president. He centralized political power. He controls the media. <coughs> He bars political parties, bans, I'm sorry, <clears throat> he bans political parties, <clears throat> excuse me, unions, all opposition, um, religion is banned. There is much propaganda, much repression. He says, I reject the Treaty of Versailles. I'm going to change the world. Put yourselves in their shoes. Would you vote for them, for him, or would you not vote for him? Let's all think. Um, so, and he promises to rebuild the German economy from scratch. I mean, everything is plastered. So, rebuild the system through an autocratic economic program, work for longer hours, full employment, public works, the autobahn system was built. Um, so, so massive uh, investment into, um, into um, infrastructure. Um, 
if you've traveled in Germany, you see in big cities, 1930s, Art Deco structures, large, massive um, public buildings, um, which in a way uh, look overwhelmingly large, um, which has a flag at the top. Um, so, so this is this was the time um, for change, and he attacks what used to be Czechoslovakia, and then Poland. World War II erupts, um, conquers much of Europe between 1939 and 1941, attacks the USSR, 1941. So this is um, this is what the German Empire looked like. So just, just see where um, German Reich allies and occupied zones. Um, Turkey was neighbor to Germany. So, so imagine, um, well, Spain, um, um, but, but, but as you can see, except for Sweden and Spain, and Spain was a different case. Uh, as you can see, Switzerland was, was independent. Um, but, but as you can see, massive expansion. Seeing it on the map, I mean, talking about it is something. Seeing it, <clears throat> I thought, on the map was, is, is something entirely else. The idea of an Aryan race um, brought with it <clears throat> concentration camps. Exterm concentration camps became um, extermination camps, which later on um, led to the Holocaust. Um, so millions were gone, evaporated. Millions stood as bystanders. And um, when you look at the death toll, 40 million lives were lost. So. Um, on this very high note, um, let's stop for today, and we'll, I'll see you um, next week.